Good morning, everybody. I think we'll get cracking as it's 10.30. We'll try and stay on time. Um, welcome to this session on stress, well-being, and resilience. Uh, I'm James. Um, before we uh, sort of crack on, a little bit of housekeeping. So we are using Slido for those that wish. Uh, so if you want to ask questions anonymously that we'll go through at the end, um, if you go to slido.com, put in IBTM World and we're in theatre three. Uh, I do try and ask you some questions that you don't need to use Slido for, but um, please feel free if you do have anonymous questions. So just, just for those who want to uh, do this, you don't have to, but uh, we're going to do a quick, uh, two quick exercises, if that's all right. Um, if everyone who would like to put their feet, both feet firmly on the floor, sit back in your chair. And uh, if you feel comfortable to do this, you can shut your eyes. And if you don't, that's OK. And we're just going to breathe in through the nose and hold it for a second or two. And then breathe out slowly. Nice long breath out. And we'll do it again. Breathing in through the nose. And hold it for a second. And then breathe out. And then we'll just do that one last time. Breathing in through the nose. Holding it for a second. And then breathing out. Nice long breath out. Now, there's not loads of you here, but if I could ask you all just to stand up very quickly, if that's all right. Or just, just you know, just loosen that off a bit, you know, just, just loo loosen it off, you know. It's okay, it's okay. And then, um, if, if you wouldn't mind finding the person closest to you, shaking them by the hand, looking at them in the eye, and asking them how they're doing, listen for the answer. Have a, have a two-minute chat. <laughs> you probably will think I'm a bit mad. Um, thank you for that. You can sit down again now. We'll crack on. So like I said, I'm James. If you want to get in touch with me via social, these are my social handles. And I've got, I'll give you my details at the end if you want to talk about any of this afterwards. Um, most importantly, how are you all doing today? How's everyone doing? Day one of IVTM World, awesome. It's probably a long few days for most of you. So, I'm often found talking about the four pillars of well-being, hence why we did those two exercises. Um, for me, the four pillars of well-being are physical, mental, spiritual, and emotional. And, and those two exercises really, for me, are covering the, the spiritual and the emotional. The breathing ex exercise is sort of connecting with self, which I view as emotional well-being, and uh, meeting someone else, connecting with someone else, with another person, is what I view as spiritual. Uh, and I think I, I, I'm, I'm a huge proponent of connection. I don't think we often talk about it enough in terms of well-being and those sorts of things. Uh, and in, a, in the largest study of its kind in the UK last year, something like 20, 25,000 people were surveyed on loneliness. And uh, they discovered that the most lonely generation are what is now labeled Gen Z, 16 to 24 year olds. So the most connected generation have come up in this huge study as the most lonely. Um, because yes, they're connected, but they're connected with these wonderful things. And I, you know, I'm not saying that these are not good things at times, but they do, uh, they do stop the interaction. A bit like this sort of big gap here between me and you guys. It sort of stops that interaction. Um, and so I view, I view connection as, as something that's really important. And like I said, it's, you know, it's when we talk about well-being, people talk about sort of the physical stuff a lot, you know, going to the gym and exercising and these crazy fat diets, like let's go gluten free and da 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 and all of this sort of stuff. But it's not all about that. This, I, I very much have a holistic view on, on well being, you know, physical, you know, the physical stuff, your healthy body, healthy mind, but healthy mind, healthy body, you know, we, we are one. So if, if we get it all working together, uh, we stand a better chance of sort of 
living day to day in, in sort of living living a better life, I guess. So I'm going to start with um, a bit of a story. Um, about me and my journey, why I'm here today talking to you about well-being, what, so what it is that brings me here. Um, my friends tell me that uh, I wear many hats, which is sort of true. I wear lots of hats. I do lots of things. Uh, I've been in the, this wonderful industry of events for about 17 years. Love to crack a joke. I know I don't look that old, which, you know, I don't. But um, uh, I'm also the general manager of the Event Marketing Association, which is the, uh, the only UK association that exclusively represents in-house corporate event professionals and, and well-being uh, is a big uh, sort of cause that we champion. I work with a, a, an industry pledge scheme called Stress Matters, um, which is all about sort of empowering teams uh, and companies to, to reduce stress within the workplace. Uh, I'm a stress and well-being consultant. I'm a member of the International Stress Management Association. God, it's lots of words, isn't it? Uh, I'm a mental health and well-being campaigner. It's, very, it's something that's very close to my heart. I, I'm a trainee psychotherapist, and I'm a recovery coach. Um, but how did I get to these things? So I, I, I've had my own struggles with, with poor mental health over the years. Um, I suffer from anxiety and depression. Uh, and I'm also in recovery from drug and alcohol addiction and an eating disorder. It's funny, it's my story, but I still have to refer to my notes. Um, <laughs> so um, my anxiety and depression was diagnosed in 2014, um, but I've been suffering with it for, for a long, it's actually for as long as I can remember, I've had issues around mood, uh, anxiety, social anxiety disorder, that sort of stuff. Um, but it was uh, diagnosed in 2014 where I suffered a breakdown, had to go to the doctor, and some suggestions were made to help hopefully improve my um, mental health and my physical health because I was not in great shape. And actually since around 2013, uh, I was in a steep decline really. Um, at the same time as trying to to treat or manage my anxiety and depression. I was still in active addiction to drugs, alcohol, eating disorder. Um, so ultimately, I, I wasn't really doing myself any favors. And I was in active addiction for about 20 years. And then things for me all came to a head. Um, that was me in 2013. <laughs> um, there aren't many pictures post that because uh, I didn't like having my picture taken. I, I was about uh, five stone, when I, when I sort of t turned my life around, I was about five stone heavier than I am now, and I was a mess. Um, and in 2017, we'll, we'll move on to a nicer slide. Uh, and in 2017, um, I hit my, my rock bottom. Um, my behavior had, uh, and just my, had become unmanageable. My use of drugs and alcohol had gone through the roof. Um, I lost my marriage, my business. I uh, was not allowed to see my children. Um, I had to go bankrupt. It all gone a bit wrong. So e externally, I'd lost pretty much everything. I'd lost friends because of my behavior and thinking I could do it on my own, um, which is something I've learned. It's, it's, um, it's, it's often harder to do it on your own. Uh, and then I got to about, um, well, and I was lonely. I was lost. I'd lost so much. There was a lot of loss. Um, and I, I got to sort of mid-2017, about May 2017, and I had no idea what to do. Um, uh, and I was in trouble, really, physically, mentally. I was, in, in, I was not in good shape. And, and so um, I asked for some help. Uh, and I went to see a psychiatrist. Um, I got some support from some family, um, and uh, I went to uh, a treatment center where they suggested the first thing I do is stop drinking, taking drugs, and doing those sorts of things. Because at that time, I had no idea that those coping mechanisms, and they were uh, what I thought were coping mechanisms, they, they were not helpful for me, but I didn't really see that. I, th I thought they made it all better. They sort of took the pain away, when in fact, they made the pain a hell of a lot worse. Um, and it was there that I, I started to rebuild my life and reevaluate things and look at things differently. 
Um, and it was a slow process. I, I was I was in a, a treatment facility for about a year. Um, I mean, it wasn't on lockdown. Uh, the, the, there was 11 months where I could sort of come and go, but I was supported. I had a lot of support for about 11, well, 12 months. And, you know, I had no confidence because I, I, I was sort of part of part of my process to make myself feel better was uh, I was sort of a, a, an egomaniac with no self-worth. So I, I paraded around thinking that I was the best businessman in the world when, in fact, I was terrible. Um, and, you know, my, my business, although it lasted nine years, didn't ever make any money. In fact, it lost a lot of money. Um, I used the funds we did make inappropriately to sort of spend it on fun things like drinking and using you know, drugs and those sorts of things. And, 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 and I, so I thought I had nothing because I put so much of my worth in the external things like my business, like having money, like all this stuff. And, and it was suggested I look inwards a little bit more uh, and work on those sorts of things so I didn't need to be an egomaniac. Uh, try and find some humility in, in my life. And, and so I, I started doing some volunteering in a charity shop. Um, I then uh, was put in touch with the Event Marketing Association, started part-time. That's now, it was not a full-time gig, but the hours I have to do to, to stay on top of it is full-time. Uh, and and I, I reconnected with people I'd met years ago in the event industry who'd moved into the field of well-being, uh, and they encouraged me to tell my story. Uh, I wanted to learn about the things it is that I have, um, and I, I wanted to help others. So. Um, so that's sort of what I did, really. And uh, so hence why I went to study. And I, I sort of, for me, learning about well-being and this sort of stuff is an ongoing journey. There's always new things. Um, uh, and I believe well-being is a journey. There's no sort of definite end. Um, and, you know, some days are good, some days are not so good. Um, and then, so that sort of takes me up to here. I've been speaking about this stuff for the last couple of years, really. Um, and working with people like Stress Matters, you know, run workshops and talks and all of that sort of stuff to try and help others, using my experience and, and the knowledge I've gained and continue to gain to try and help others. Um, so anyway, that's my story and that's why I'm here. Um, you know, and if, if, if people are having difficulty with whatever it is, you know, I, I truly believe that um, however bad it gets, it, it, it does get better. Um, and definitely I think my, my story shows that. If, if I could turn it around, anyone can. Um, you know, and I've not done it alone, and that's something I, I, I have to stress. Uh, I thought I could do everything on my own. I thought I could fix every problem on my own. I thought, you know, everyone would view me as weak if I asked for help, which is just so not true. It was so misinformed of me. Um, asking for help has been the best thing I've ever done. Um, you know, one of the reasons I talk about this stuff it is, is because... Um, it is okay not to be okay. And I think it, you know, there's a still a huge stigma. We're getting better in the world, in society, in our industry at talking about mental health, but it's still not on equal par, I believe. It's still not on equal, an equal level as, as physical health. Because you know, in physical health, you can see a broken arm, you can see a broken leg, but you, you can't see depression, you can't see anxiety, you can't see stress so much. Um, and and um, people feel judged. I used to feel judged. I mean, I wouldn't tell my employees when I ran my agency that I was super stressed and having mental health problems because I thought they'd have thought I was weak. They'd be like, oh, you're weak. But, you know, th we, we all have good days and bad days, ultimately. Um, and we all react differently to situations in life. And, and I've learned that being able to share it is, is um, a hugely powerful thing. So... Before I ask this question, can you, can you stand up for me, those who think, well, who, who has mental health in this room? Who has mental health? Stand up then, Ken. If you think you have mental health, please stand up. We all have mental health. We, we all have it, and you know, sometimes it's, well, for me anyway, sometimes it's good and sometimes it's bad. You can sit down, thank you very much. Um, so what is mental health? Mental health, as I mentioned, it's part of our overall being. You know, it's, it's we are one. Um, if this isn't working so good, often our bodies aren't working so well, and if our bodies aren't working so well, it can affect our minds. It's about, mental health is about how we feel, think, and behave. It's how we cope with the good things, with the bad things, the ups, the downs, the stresses. 
it's how we feel about ourselves. And, and I often, and I'll talk about this in a bit, but quite often um, a negative view of oneself, we actually project that outwards. We, we, don't, we think we're not, we think we're, we're just, we, you know, like I used to not like myself very much at all. Um, but I thought I was the only one that knew that. Um, and in fact, looking back, it's quite obvious that, that my behavior very much projected with the way I felt about me was that was, it came out, it came across to other people. How we see ourselves, how we see our future. future. Future gazing can often be quite stressful. If I think about what I've got to do tomorrow, I'm a mess. I've got to keep it in today for me. Uh, if I'm thinking about next Friday, I'm, I'm in all sorts of trouble. Um, because I can run away with it and the fantasies go on and this will happen and this will happen and I can't predict the future. And, and I think, you know, in, especially in this job, you know, we, we have to sometimes try and predict the future in events, which we can't do. So trying to just accept things as they are for me is, is, has been very helpful. But, you know, it's great to have aspirations. It's great to have dreams. You know, I'm, you know I would never say don't dream. Mental health is about how stress affects us. Um, Stress, I, I, I thought I was you know, immune to stress. Turns out I wasn't. Uh, and I went through some issues. Um, and I think to some degree, maybe we all feel stress in some way. But it, you know, it doesn't have a negative impact for some, and for others it does. And it's about how we then deal with, with negative events. So I would deal with it by drinking 20 beers and taking drugs and all sorts of stuff, um, which for me was not helpful. Um, I'm not going to stand here and say no one should drink or anything, but just be mindful of it, especially when you're busy. If you are stressed, alcohol can um, be unhelpful. Um, so just it's something to be mindful of. And it's about our self-esteem and our confidence. Self-esteem is really important. Um, for me, anyway, it's really important. I can only talk from my experience. But self-esteem is it's you know when we do things that generates, you know, if we do something esteemable, that will build our self-esteem. And, and l like I referred to earlier, if, if, if we're not thinking well of ourselves, if we're not friendly towards ourselves, that can often be projected outwards. So the cost of mental health, of poor mental health, in the UK is about, give or take, because uh, there's slightly different numbers if you do Google searches, but in the UK it's about £1,300 per employee per employer in the UK, which is a lot of money for poor mental health. Hence why I think it really does need to be on an equal footing with physical health. Um, and treated, and like I said, I think we're getting better as a society. But it's, it's an expensive business, poor mental health. Um, expensive to the economy. Um, and ultimately, it's really damaging to the individual. And that's who the most important person is. Um, I would love it if that figure comes down over time. So fingers crossed. So here's some stats, just a couple of stats. So 26, these, this is from a survey we recently run with Stress Matters. 26% of adults who had taken a day of work because of a poor mental health problem reported lying about it. Now, hands up in the room. Be honest with me. Who has lied about their mental state, if they've had to take a day off, or if, you know, who's, who's lied? Who's told a porcupine and said they have got the flu when maybe they haven't? It's okay, it's okay to be honest. Honesty is the best policy. And the reason I used to lie about it was because I thought I'd be judged and thought people would say, that's rubbish, that doesn't exist. Well, I, I, I can tell you from my experience, it does exist. 58% um, of people aren't comfortable telling their boss if they were diagnosed with a mental health issue. This is just for my own sort of uh, curiosity. Um, who would feel comfortable telling their boss tomorrow if they were diagnosed with some form of mental health disorder? Who would feel comfortable speaking to their boss about it? Okay, that's okay. That's not bad. I've, I've asked that question in rooms where no one's put their hand up. And 20% of people believe their line manager would be supportive if they're battling a mental health disorder. Who feels that their sort of direct line manager would be supportive if they were struggling? That's better. It's better than, it's better than 20%. This is, I like this room. This is great. So stress, who does stress affect? I've alluded to, I believe stress affects everyone. Would, would everyone agree with me? Yeah, to a point, to a degree. I'm not saying that everyone is knocked out by it, but uh, you know, I think that yeah, everyone feels 
some form of stress, you know, pre-event. You know, I, does everyone get like a bit of anxiety, you know, which can be translated into stress. So I think everyone, there's, there's, but it's varying levels, and I'll show you what I mean by that in a minute. So the definition, oh no, well, not quite the definition. Let's just, can we, can we do some shouting out? What does stress mean to people in this room? What does it mean? Does it mean to you anxiety? Yes, hello. Running like a headless chicken. Uh, yeah, rushing around. What else does it mean? Yes, hello. Getting out of your comfort zone, feeling uncomfortable, yes? Ken, you must have a view on... <laughs> Yeah, well, what does it mean to you? Overwhelmed? Great. Anyone else? Yes, hello, hello, hello. Yeah. P reduced productivity. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, for me, 100%. Too many things to do in one day. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's just a bit rubbish, isn't it? Stress. It's horrible. It's, it's uh, unproductive. It makes you feel uncomfortable. It can have a real effect on others, actually. Um, so so the, the dictionary definition of stress is a, a state of mental or emotional strain or tension resulting from adverse or demanding circumstances. To be fair, I can feel stressed when there's no adverse uh, circumstances. But that's just me. I'm a sensitive soul. Um, I guess importantly, do, do you guys know, as a group of people in this room, when you are actually feeling stressed or when a colleague, when your team are feeling stressed, do you know the signs? It's really important that if you understand you, it's easier to understand others. So who, who's got some symptoms? Who, who wants to share a symptom with me? So either too quiet and keeping it to themselves, so not asking for help, or complaining a lot. I, I recognize both of those things. A lot of sweets, yeah. Unhealthy eating, eating patterns. Anyone else? I mean, I used to dr use drink and other things, so which, which again, not helpful because then I wouldn't sleep, and then the vicious cycle begins. You put your hand up again. Yep. Bad moods. I mean, I, I I love a good tantrum when I'm in when I'm a bit stressed. I'm I'm quite grumpy and I take it out on others when in fact it's nothing to do. It's not their fault at all. Um, so stress. So like I said, I don't I don't I don't drink anymore or do any of those other unhelpful things that were unhelpful for me. And, and I'm a member of Alcoholics Anonymous, and they they say that alcoholism or addiction is a family disease because w when you're in it. You don't think you're affecting anyone, but in fact, I affected a lot of people. Like I said earlier, that you know, I lost a lot of people, I lost a lot of stuff and things. And, and I believe stress is the same. When we're stressed, um, we don't always know we're doing it. We're not aware of it so much because we're in it, we're in the zone. But uh, it, it can outwardly affect others, one's mood, you know, and not just in the office. We can take it home, um, and it, so it can have an effect not just on you and your team members. It can have effect on your family life, your home life. So, a fun fact, um, you may or may not agree, I'll tell you my views on this in a second, uh, that the event professional in 2017 and 2018 by a US company, the job of being an event professional was voted as fifth most stressful job. But in 2019, career cast have put it as sixth. I'm not going to really, you can read into it what you, you want about the number it is. It is stressful. The reasons why it's stressful, we're a deadline driven industry. We can't phone our client up and go, I'm having a bad day. Can we do the event in a week's time, please? We, we can't do that because uh, that would be a very expensive way of doing things. So we are, we are deadline driven. We have a lot of top down pressure. We, um, we're an industry of yes people. I mean, I would, when I ran my agency, it's probably one of the reasons why I lost it. Um, I'd say yes to everything. Um, and then put that onto my team and try and get them to deliver everything. And it just wasn't practical. Um, and I believe that most of us in the event industry are a little bit, bit of a control freak. Who would admit to being a control freak? 
Is everyone being honest? Um, and so I think we put a lot of pressure on ourselves, a lot of expectation on ourselves to deliver. And so I, I agree that it's a stressful job. Um, we're not saving lives. Like the first four, five are soldier, firefighter, airline pilot, police, live broadcaster. Um, in their top 10 doctor or surgeons are in there, and I would question that. I think, I think being a doctor or a surgeon is probably quite stressful. Um, and just fun fact, um, a medical sonographer was the least stressful job, apparently. Uh, who knew? But I think we would agree that it can be quite stressful events, right? I think we go over and above quite often in the event industry. Um, so in a survey that we undertook recently, 91% of people in the event industry work more than 41 hours a week. 50% work more than 51 hours a week. And 20% work more than 61 hours a week. Who in this room is a sort of in the 91%? Who's a more than 41 hours a week, but less than 51? A few. Who's in the 50%, so more than 51? but less than 61. One there. I'm sort of in that bracket. I, I flip between the top two. And who is in the, is anyone in the top, the 61 hours or more a week? Whew. That sounds stressful. Um, and I think we're expected, you know, because events is not a nine to five business. We don't go in on a Monday at nine and finish at five and all sanky dory, you know, we can work through the night. We can, you know, it's, it's not normal. So we have to, in this industry as well, try and think outside the box. Flexi working is something I'm a huge fan of, remote working. You know, a work environment that allows us to thrive, um, but also reduce stress uh, and, you know, allow us to, to get what we need as individuals. Um, in the same survey, we, we asked, you know, what the, the biggest cause of stress was and, and high workload came in number one um, at 68% of people surveyed and then, and then uh, unrealistic deadlines who recognises the idea of unrealistic deadlines come on who's got clients that can be unreasonable it's alright, this is a confidential space, it's okay um, So yeah, d deadlines and demanding clients sort of are relatively close at 59 and 58 percent. But you know, it, it's a lot of work. You know, events, you know, many moving parts. We're not always in control of everything. As much as we would love to be in control, because we're control freaks, someone else is, you know, someone else may be responsible for transport if they don't show up. That you know, that's not you can't do anything about that um, if someone else has let you down. But that's quite stressful when it happens. Again, in our survey this year, 91% um, of event profs work more than 40 hours a week, 40 hours a week. 72% experience sleep issues. Does anyone here ever have problems sleeping? And that could be not enough, that could be too much, could be broken sleep. And 46% of people surveyed uh, use uh, coping mechanisms such as drugs, alcohol, Overeating, undereating, those sorts of coping mechanisms to try and manage their stress. Now, stress um, can be mapped onto a curb, um, and just for you know, have a th have a you take pictures. I, I can share these slides with everyone afterwards as well if they like. Uh, you, you you've got these your zones. They're too little stress when you're sort of just lying down and very chilled out on the beach. Um, there is an optimum level of stress. Um, I used to um, thrive, actually. The only time I did, the, the adrenaline pre-event, pre-show, I found really, uh, I was sort of focused and in the zone for that period. Um, I'd crash hugely after it. Um, that sort of post-event post crash got really depressed post every event I did. Um, but there is an optimum level of stress. Um, then there's too much stress and burnout. For, for about four years, I was sort of in sort of orange and red. Um, and they're, you know, they're dangerous because they, 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 they can have a, a, really, a really sort of deep impact on, on people's long-term mental and physical health. So, I mean, one of the reasons I'm here is to try and give you some, some sort of pointers, some suggestions on, on how one could um, reduce stress, improve well-being, and build up resilience. And, and 
it's not what it's not is it's it's not insurmountable like i said you know sort of the stuff i've been through it can get better it does get better it just takes time it takes a bit of work personal responsibility is really important um and it takes doing things in small bite-sized chunks don't do it all at once because that can often be quite can have a can have a negative impact if because if you don't achieve something, you're going to judge yourself, and then you know that can feed into lowering one's self-esteem and, and value. So uh, I mentioned it earlier: <coughs> the four pillars of, of for me of, of well-being are physical, mental, spiritual, and emotional. And like I said, I, I view it very much as a holistic view, trying to find balance. And we'll talk about balance in a minute. Um, but trying to look at all areas of your life. Um, and sometimes it's not achievable, you know, and that's okay. It's okay if, you know, if you're a fan of meditating and you can't meditate that day, that's okay. The world isn't going to end. You know, you will get to live another day. But it's also being kind to yourself just to say, well, okay, I didn't get to do that thing today. We'll do it again tomorrow. Um, for me, I think um, well-being, resilience, all these things, I think, I think they start with um, being open, open-minded, open to opportunities, you know, trying new things. Where before I uh, before I entered recovery from addiction, before I found this this sort of path of well-being and recovery, uh, the idea of things like meditation and all that, I was like, yeah, rubbish. That's not going to help me. I'm, you know, I, I'm, you know, I don't need that stuff. Um, so I was very closed-minded, and, and my my outlook now is to tr just to try things, and you know, because you need to try stuff to know if it works for you or not. Um, and what works for me may not work for you. So, and there's loads of different things that one can try in terms of well-being, from different exercises, looking at what you, what you eat, looking at your sleeping patterns, your working patterns. There's just so many different things out there. Um, so it's trying, trying out new things. So you owe you. It starts, well-being starts with you. At work, our, our, so that uh, ultimately it's personal responsibility. If you want to do it, you can. Um, you don't have to do it. You know, it's up to you. It's personal responsibility. It's a personal choice. Um, I, I believe that in, in a work environment, it, it's a two-way street. So personal responsibility, but also employers um, should create a platform for those that want to live well to live well. So I think it's a two-way street. But ultimately, it starts with you. You know, if you're not going to look after you, no one else is. And that's all I've got to say on that bit, actually. <laughs> so eat and exercise. Um, nutrition, movement, really, really important. Um, now, I'm not going to say you've got to go to the gym 20 times a week and you've got to take loads of protein. Because uh, that, that doesn't work for me. But it does work for some people. But for me, like I said, it's about balance. So movement, movement is really important because we are designed as human beings. The machine that is the human being is designed to move. The more we move, the easier it is to move. You know, if we are, I don't know, if you've been ill and in bed for a long time, you know, you uh, lose sort of muscle strength. And it's just everything's a bit harder for those first few days when you get up again. So movement is really important. And, and just doing something that suits you, you know, not everything suits everybody, if you know what I mean. Like I like to do a bit of yoga, I like to do a bit of walking, occasionally I do a bit of running. And on the odd occasion, I go to a gym. But it, it's, it's, it's just about getting your heart rate up. It's about um, getting the blood pumping. We, we, we sort of shed toxins when we are um, exercising. But it doesn't, like I said, it doesn't have to be this crazy regimen. Just do what suits you. And again, around eating, I'm not a fan of fad diets and all of that sort of stuff because I think they can send a really negative message, not to all, but to some. And because and I'm in recovery from an eating disorder, I'm really mindful about this stuff. Um, but eating um, things that are useful, especially if we're stressed. So hitting the Haribo and the Coca-Cola when we're like on site, um, as much as we get a sugar rush, not particularly helpful for long-term um, sustainable blood sugar levels. You get a spike and you get a massive drop. Um, not too much caffeine. Uh, I mean, I, I love coffee myself. Uh, that's the one thing that I've not been able to give up yet. But um, 
But again, actually, it's been, there's studies recently, but actually how not using caffeine can give you more energy. Um, but it's about, again, balance. So it's, you know, um, looking at what, what you eat in terms of portion size. It's about having a balance of proteins, carbohydrates, fats. Um, I, eat, I try and eat three meals and three snacks a day to try and keep a consistent level of blood sugar throughout the day, which gives me more energy, which gives me a little bit more focus throughout the day. Um, and, and actually, that's something I try and do, especially when I'm traveling. If I am working on site at an event, trying to keep um, really strict boundaries about that, um, for me, is really important. So eating and exercise, are, are, I think, are really key, and they really tie into the physical side of things. Um, the NICE guidelines for, for mental health um, exercise is, is prescribed to, to boost mental health. You get endorphins from it. Um, it can help reduce stress uh, and elevate mood. This is probably my most important, um, apart from a dodgy slide, uh, it's pro my, my most important piece of uh, advice is sleep. I used to think I could thrive on no sleep. Turns out I was totally wrong and I was crap. Um, some people can. But as humans, um, we are actually hardwired to have somewhere between seven and nine hours sleep a night. Um, and sleep is super important. When we're sleeping, our body detoxifies. There's all these sort of magical things that happen when we sleep that don't happen when we're awake. Um, so it's really important sort of to cleanse the body, to rest. Um, sleep deprivation is a form of torture for a reason. So sleep is super important. Um, and with that, sleep hygiene. Um, you know, like if you have, does anyone have children here? So like when you have little kids, you have a bedtime routine and you know, you have a getting up routine. Normally they get up way too early anyway, but you have a bedtime routine, you know, which might involve going for a bath, having a story and then going to bed. As grown-ups, as adults, and you know, that gets them into a sort of, that's, you know, starts off a good sleep hygiene routine. As grown-ups, for some reason, Someone said at some point, well, we don't need to do that anymore, which is rubbish. Actually, as grown-ups who are contaminated with the world around us, we need routine as much as, if not more, than a child. Uh, routine keeps us grounded. It keeps me grounded. Um, and so sleep hygiene, going to bed at the same time every day, getting up at the same time every day, not having your phone in your bed uh, at night. Who takes their phones to bed and does a bit of like Instagram and... You know, the blue light, as much as they say you can turn the blue light down, you still get really overstimulated by these things. And so it can have, not, not everyone, but it can have a really negative impact on your sleep. Um, you know, trying to be in a dark room, um, all those sorts of things. But having a, like a bedtime routine, if we have a bedtime routine, our bodies know that it's nearly sleep time. So we start making the right hormones. So melatonin is produced so we can uh, start going to sleep. And then likewise, if we get up at the same time, our body knows when to start pushing out the cortisol to get us up. Um, so sleep hygiene is really, really important, I believe. So no is not negative. Setting boundaries, being assertive, uh, something that I was terrible at. I used to go, yes, I'll do this. Yes, I'll do that. Yes, it's okay. And then I'd probably end up doing none of those things because I said yes to way too many people and was in care and I just sort of, it was just overwhelmed. Um, so, and, and, and learning to set boundaries has taken me, and I'm still learning. I don't get it right all the time, and, and, and I think that's okay. Um, but learning to be assertive, learning to say no, I, I can't do that right now, I will get to it. But actually being really clear and explicit with, with, with boundaries. Um, and not just in work, but at home. Um, I think it's a really important practice, and it takes practice, it really does. Um, you know, if you can't do something, that's okay. If the other person is going to react negatively, that's on them. You know, we have no control over how people are going to react, but we can control ourselves. Uh, and you know, overwhelming ourselves. You know, someone mentioned you know reduced productivity when we're stressed. You know, if we're just over overloading ourselves, we'll end up doing a worse job anyway, potentially. So value, what's important to you? What are your values? You might not know, and there are exercises you can do to, uh, to find out what, what your values are. But you know, what makes you happy? What makes you sad? Um, what's your purpose in life? And I don't mean just getting up and going to work. Uh, and in fact, purpose, I think, is really, really important. And Ken, who's sat here, will be doing a talk on purpose on Thursday. 
Um, so I did an exercise uh, about a year ago, actually, on, on purpose for myself. And so I believe that my purpose is to be compassionate, connected, and of service to others. So to be kind to me as well as other people, to be connected. So to, to actually have meaningful conversations and meaningful time with other human beings, not via one of these, <laughs> and to help people. And everyone's purpose is different. Everyone's values are different. But understanding what your values are, what makes you tick, I think is really important. Self-awareness is, you know, if, if we understand ourselves, we're much better at understanding others. Treasure your time. Time management still, I, I talk about time management a lot, but I can still be a bit rubbish at it. And over, you know, expect I can do something in five minutes that takes me five hours. And then I get really disappointed with myself. Who, who has any issues with time management? Who feels they've just not got enough time? There's not enough hours in the day. And treasuring our time, I think, is, is really important. And, and um, I think it's all important, but I'll say that a lot. I think everything's important. But it's, it's about how do we manage our time. It's about prioritizing, because time, time uh, can be, time's brilliant, because you know, we, we have to turn up to meetings on time and things like that. But also time, I feel, can be really uh, quite a sort of um, constricting type of framework. So I can sort of say, I need to get this done by then and set a deadline that no one else has set. I set myself all these hard deadlines that, that, that are, they're meaningless, yet they cause me loads of stress. So it's about looking at what needs to be done, when does it need to be done, what time can I have for me? I have a client that I've, I'm working with who, who is a recovering, um, recovering addict, and uh, she loves to be just busy, 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 busy. She's a human doing, not really a human being. And, and, and I set her these odd challenges, like, can you just, in your weekend, can you find two hours that's just for you, not doing any work, not doing any like reading about recovery, just do watch crap telly, read a book, have a bath, listen to some music, don't do anything. And I think having time to be with self is really important. It can be quite uncomfortable for people, but it's really important just to sort of de-stress, just to, just to reset. So time management's really important. And there's great sort of like, in terms of work, there's great apps out there like Trello and all sorts of time management stuff. But it's also about building in things for you and, and trying to plot out, you know, the, 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 the must-dos, you know, in your day. Get them done, then we feel a bit better. Who likes a list? Who has lists? Yeah, <laughs> I have lists of lists. It's terrible. Um, but time, look, you know, treasuring our time is really important. Balance. This is probably my favorite word in, in regards to well-being in ter terms of life. Now, I do not believe in the phrase work-life balance. I think it's rubbish. Um, that's just my view. And the reason I don't like it is because um, I think life is just the most, it's, it is the most important thing, right? So, and, and I don't believe that work is as important as life. Work is part of our life. So I believe in living a balanced life. And we are the sum of all of our parts. So family, friends, work, hobbies, all of that is really important. That makes us who we are. Um, Hence why I don't believe in work-life balance. You know, not, you know, but when I say balance, I don't, I don't mean sort of just a flat line because I don't think that necessarily exists. And that could be quite mundane, but life is, you know, it fluctuates, doesn't it? So if work is really busy, like out here this week, you might be out here all week, loads of meetings, work's really busy. That's okay, but it's then trying to find time to sort of re recalibrate and, and, you know, get some time off, uh, spend time with friends or family. And it's about trying to find balance across the board you know, with family, friends, work, whatever it might be in your life. Um, but balance is really important. But if you can't find balance, don't beat yourself up. That is also really important. Um, I say it's my favorite word, but you know, something like, like a, again, this week, totally out of balance. It's just really busy, but that's okay. And it's quite busy for the next couple of weeks. But then I've booked in some time off where I can do some of the things that I enjoy. Search out support, it goes back to what I was saying at the big beginning, connection. Um, support has changed my life, quite literally saved my life. Asking for help, that first very daunting step for me has literally saved my life. 
and uh, I encourage everyone to do it. In, in whether it be having someone at work you feel comfortable talking to about what's going on for you, whether it be uh, a mentor outside of work, um, whether it be a family friend, a therapist, a coach, um, a support group. I think it's really important to be able to speak your truth. Um, and people will listen. There are plenty of people out there that will listen. Um, and I think that's for, some, for lots of people, sometimes it's just about being heard. Um, you know, sometimes when I'm talking with, with, for example, like I said, I'm in Alcoholics Anonymous and I have a sponsor. I phone him and I rant down the phone at him, going blah, you know, you know about some really insignificant problem. But in that moment, it's quite serious for me. And he's just listening. He's not trying to solve my problems. He's not trying to fix my life. He's just there to listen. And I feel better because I've offloaded it. So it's really important to find support. Um, we did a part of the survey that we ran as Stress Matters. 63% of people have at least one person at work uh, that they can talk to about their, whatever it is going, that's going on for them, um, are 40% less stressed than those that don't have a person. Uh, and in fact, we recently launched at Stress Matters um, a thing called Buddies Matter, uh, which is about, um, it was the, the idea came from, free, from freelancers in the event industry who may not have a team, may not have people around them, uh, so they can be well-being buddies. Um, but it's for anyone, really, anyone in the industry. So you can have a buddy at work, you can have a buddy outside of work. It's, it's sort of a peer-to-peer -peer support scheme, just people helping each other, listening to each other in a non-judgmental way. Um, quick question. It's all right, we're getting near the end. Uh, so uh, do you feel comfortable talking to people at work about how you're feeling? Who feels comfortable talking about how you're feeling at work? Not that many, not that many. I mean, I didn't used to. Um, I think it's really important now, and, and given what I do, I talk about how I'm feeling quite a lot. So, uh, but again, so it, we, we, we surveyed lots of people, and 30%, 35% of employees did not approach anyone for support on the most recent occasion they experienced poor mental health, which, which is really sad. It makes me really sad, because it's so important. You know, people bottling it up, all sorts of things can happen. Uh, and you know, ultimately, the, the I don't want to sort of over-dramatize it, but you know, there are lots of people who end up not feeling they're listened to or heard, and, and it does end up in people taking their own lives. And, and so people feeling confident to be able to say what's going on for them, I think is really important, especially you know, in the work environment, to, to encourage it. It's, it's really important. 86% of people we surveyed would think twice before offering help to a colleague um, whose mental health they were concerned about. Who, who here um, would feel comfortable supporting a colleague if they were suffering? Yeah? I mean, it's, you know, sometimes I think there's a fear factor. There's the fear of the unknown. What do I say? What do I do? And like I said, sometimes it's not about doing anything. It's not about saying anything. It's just about listening. Um, joy in the journey. Um, <clears throat> I believe joy ultimately comes from within. Um, and it's taken me a while, but I, and it's something I work on every day. You know, some days I'm more joyful than others. But joy is really important, enjoying what we do. Um, and, and, you know, if, if someone doesn't, for example, like their job, it's, it's looking at the, what, what, what are the positives, you know? Are there any skills I'm learning? Okay, I might not like the job, it might be boring or whatever, but is there, it's about reframing it. Perception is really important. Um, I mean, I used to be the sort of half glass empty kind of guy. Everything's a problem. Everything's an issue. Oh. Um, and I can still get like that if I'm stressed and I can still fall back into old patterns. But actually, it's, it, it's about trying to reframe it. And my sponsor, he's always saying, just reframe it. How can you reframe it? How can you, how can you look at that in a different way? Um, and when I talk about joy, I talk about gratitude. Does anyone here practice any form of gratitude, like a gratitude list or anything like that? Just me. Oh, no, there's a couple of you. Gratitude is really important. And in fact, they've done studies that actually, um, when one is practicing gratitude, it changes the, the way the neural pathways are working. Um, and it can reduce stress um, and can actually have positive benefits for not just mentally, but physically. There are, there are, cause there are huge connections, obviously, between mind and body. Uh, and so gratitude is really important. Um, there are books on it. Um, I do a gratitude list every morning. 
um, most mornings. Some mornings I do forget, and that's okay. Um, but yeah, gratitude's really important. Remembering what we have rather than the things we don't. Breathe and believe. Um, so we did a little breathing exercise at the beginning. It's not just about breathing. So obviously meditation, I'm a huge fan of meditation. I'm a huge fan of mindfulness. It doesn't have to be a, med a mindfulness meditation. Something like yoga is a very mindfulness exercise. You're, you're sort of very much in yourself, in your mind when you're doing it. You're very present. Or drawing. So on the seats in front, for those that want one, I can give them to you. I've, I've left you these. And this is, this is a drawing exercise we've created, which is essentially just to sit and be mindful and draw and be in the moment when you're drawing it. Um, so things like that. Reading is very mindful. Um, you can do um, going on a mindful walk. So when I say a mindful walk, no headphones in, but walking around, listening to all of the sounds, be it cars on the road, birds in the trees, trying to be mindful having a really mindful conversation. So when you're talking, actually listening. And I've also left on your seats the wheel of well-being, my favorite thing. Um, <laughs> so what's up on the, uh, on the left of the slide there? That's just an example. So the wheel of well-being, you can do it any time, and, and you're welcome to photocopy it. You're welcome to do whatever you like with these. Um, but you can sort of take a spot check of how you're doing, where you're at. Uh, and looking at uh, areas of your life, for example, career, personal growth, fun and recreation, health, physical environment, romance, friends and family, money, career. And you can see you know, where you're at. So the middle uh, is essentially naught, and the outer ring is 10. Ideally, we'd like to be a 10 around the, across the board, but in reality, there's probably always something that's not quite where we want it to be, and that's okay, but we can then identify that and work on it. Um, I'm a huge fan of it as well. When, when I work with people, we quite often do one of these just to start with, just to see how people are doing, how they're feeling in that moment. And this can change day to day. Um, but please feel free to take that. So workshops that we run um, at Stress Matters um, are varied. So things on stress management. I, mean, I, I think the whole... The, I could talk about well-being for probably for every minute of every day um, and be very boring, but uh, it's because, because of where I went to and where I am now, it, it's just so important. Um, but we run these workshops, so stress management, writing a well-being plan, that can be a personal well-being plan, that can be a company well-being plan. But when we say a well-being plan, not just a policy that's in you know, a big document of lots of words in a contract, it's something that's not got many words and is really deliverable, practical, that those who want to get involved with can get involved with. Um, it's not something that, you know, that can be, say, we've got a well-being policy, but people are frightened to act on it. It's something that we can do this every day in our working lives. Emotional intelligence, which is very much you know, understanding you, understanding others, um, looking at empathy, looking at self-awareness, resilience. Resilience, I mean, <clears throat> Again, I think resilience, some people just have it, some, but I think you can learn it. And again, it's about practice. It's about taking small steps, changing behavior slightly, thinking about things slightly differently. Um, but so we do workshops around resilience, mindfulness, and the be do balance. The be do balance, essentially, uh, we're human beings, right? But so many of us, and I think so many of us in this industry in particular, are human doings. We're always on the go, we're always rushing, we're stressed. Oh my God. But it's okay to just sit back, take a breath, and, and you know, not do those things for a minute. Um, so it's just that, that talks about trying to find balance and ways that one can still achieve everything they want to achieve, but in a balanced way. The other thing we do at uh, Stress Matters is um, mental health first aid courses in the UK. Um, does anyone here in their organization have a mental health first aider? Does anyone know what a mental health first aider is? Okay, so it's just someone who, who, rather than looking after, you know, like cuts and sprains and all the paper cuts and all of that stuff, uh, can put a plaster on, it's, uh, or someone who can do CPR, this is someone who can spot the signs of um, you know, poor mental health. If someone's struggling, can direct them in, in uh, point them in the right way. They're not there to counsel, they're not there to solve problems, but they are sort of the first port of call. They're someone that an, uh, a colleague can go to. Um, and, um, 
and sort of and help them listen non-judgmentally, um, and then signpost them in the right direction. Do we have any questions? Do we have any, did anyone put anything on Slido? Ooh, I have to come down here. How do I cope with stress before my presentations? Good question. Um, it changes, but today, for example, I was listening to some meditation music. I do a bit of breathing. I sort of keep myself to myself for a little bit. Uh, I try and be as prepared as possible, but as always, I was still tweaking things about half an hour before, which is never helpful for me. Um, but everyone has a different strategy, but it's just try not to drink too much coffee either, because I do like coffee, but um, coffee really sort of gets me anxious. So um, I try and reduce my caffeine, uh, take some time for myself, and I listen to some calming music. How can we cope with non-negotiable deadlines of the events we organize? Well, um, good question. And, and I guess if you're a sole worker, freelancer, you're doing it all on your own, it can be more challenging. But if you're working in a team, talking with your team, delegating, sharing, sharing the workload, and being honest about how you're coping with the workload, honesty is the best policy. Bottling it up and just saying, no, I can do it, I can do it, I can do it, and then getting to the deadline and it's not quite where you want it to be is just the most stressful. So um, being open, being honest, um, talking to colleagues. Um, does anyone else have any input on that? Does anyone else struggle with deadlines or has struggled with deadlines? And No? OK. Where does the company start if it wants to introduce a well-being culture? Well, that's the, it sort of starts at the top, actually, um, ideally in a perfect world. Because um, if you've got a CEO that's bonkers, that generally filters down through the business. If you've got a CEO that has no interest in well-being, that often filters down through the business. So it, like I said at the beginning, it's a two-way street. I think it's a top-down, bottom-up approach. Um, you can start in your teams. If, if it's not so much, uh, if well-being is not practiced in the company, try and bring it in in your teams. You know. Have walking meetings rather than sitting around a boardroom table drinking coffee. Um, take your lunch break. Don't eat your lunch at your desk. Do it as a team as well. Just go and chat for 20 minutes, half an hour even. Eat your lunch, nod at your desk. With you know, go to, go out, go to your a meeting room or something. Just go and do something as a team. Um, that, I mean, there, there, there's all of the nice things like you know, company yoga and mindfulness and all of that's great. But they're, they're in terms of a company well-being culture, I view them as nice-to-haves. The must-have is, is the cultural aspect, and, it, and, and I believe it needs to filter through every level of the business. Um, and and if, if you know, people are given the permission to practice well-being, that's great. And if they don't want to do it as an individual, that's okay. That's on them. But I believe every company should provide, should's a terrible word, has, has the responsibility to provide a platform for people to live well. And that's it. Does anyone else have any questions? No? Well, ladies and gentlemen, my name is James. Thank you very much for listening. I'm around for the next couple of days. I'll happily share my, my details with you if anyone wants to catch up and talk more about this stuff. Thank you.